Okay, let's get going again. There have been a number of people that have worked on this particular project of trying to find out and locate where they think Jesus really was crucified. There are a number of different videos that are that you can watch on uh, on YouTube and such where they describe some of the things that they found and some of the reasons why they believe that these spots are actually the places. <coughs> One of the ones that I know that some of you have seen, and, and if you haven't seen it, it'd be good for you to go and watch it, is some of the information that has been put out by uh, the, the uh, archaeologist Ron Wyatt. He is very strongly uh, a believer that this was the location of of where it was that Jesus Christ was indeed crucified. There is a, a location nearby here that uh, was found by a man by the name of Gordon years ago. And there was a tomb, and we'll discuss it more tomorrow. <laughs> but they, all, they call it today the, the Gordon tomb. Which there's very strong evidence that this was indeed the place where Jesus was buried, not inside that cathedral. But one of the amazing things to me is with the whole idea of the crucifixion and what happened that day. In the book of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, 27, 22 through 54, there is a long discussion there of what happened at the cross. And where I wanted to go with this, then, is after Jesus cries out and in a loud voice he gives up his spirit in verse 50. It says at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the body of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the Holy Spirit uh, city and appeared to many people. So when the centurion and those with him who, had, who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Now, one of the things I want you to notice is it says the earth shook and the rocks split. One of the things that uh, in his, his writings and in his uh, videos that Ron Wyatt shares with us is the fact that he was at a, uh, one point in his life there at this, basically at this location where this Golgotha is. Сюда, 
And as he was looking in this area, he found a place where there were definitely three places where crosses would have been placed into the ground. At the place where the center cross was, <coughs> there was a definite location where, where they would have put up signs to say something about the one who's crucified. And of course the Bible tells us that they were to put up this sign that says this is Jesus the King of the Jews. But the thing that was amazing to him was that at that center one there was crack going down. He believed that the Lord was telling him there was something down there below that. So he got permission from the uh, Israeli government to go down into that area. What he found down in that area was a cave. The cave had been sealed. But he got permission to remove the seal. It was sealed with rocks, with, with, with light bricks. He wanted to find out what was in there. So they began to remove those bricks and got a hole where he could go into the other part of the cave. Now his claim is sounds pretty far out. Uh, his claim was that when he went in there, he saw a large box thing, object there. That he realized was the Ark of the Covenant. And people kind of, oh, yeah, right, you know. He said it was almost an hour before he could even move. But he was able to go on in and he discovered that just above the Ark of the Covenant was this crack that went up to where that center post was. And there was dark things that looked like it could have been blood. He was able to scrape some of that off. Put it into a, a plastic bag. He later took that back to Nashville, Tennessee. To have it in analyzed. When they analyzed the blood, the people were asking him, said, where in the world did you get this blood? Said, we have never seen anything like this. The analyzation of the blood shows it to have only the female chromosome. He believes that from that, this was indeed the blood of Christ. Who, because he was from Mary, but was from God, 
there was no male chromosome existing. Вот почему? Потому что исходя из того, что он был сыном Марии, но и как бы отцом его был Бог, то там просто не могли присутствовать мужские хромосомы. The first time I heard this, I was very, very skeptical. Thought like, yeah, right. You know. Then I, we had a man come over to teach at UBI, who was from Nashville, Tennessee, where Ron White was from. The man's name was Miles Cawthon. Miles is a preacher and teacher in the Church of Christ there. <coughs> and I got into a discussion about this with Miles. And Miles said, well, I've been a personal friend of Ron Wyatt's and his wife for a long time. And he says, I have personally seen those documents that analyze that blood. That all of a sudden lend, lended some credibility to this story to me. <laughs> and, and I got to thinking, you know, certainly the God that we know from the Bible, it would be just like him to do something like this, that man would completely, you know, not even understand, but... And what Ryan, uh, Ron White claims happened was that this Ark of the Covenant had been hidden there for years and years and years and years. In his writings, he gives a very logical explanation of as to why it would have been hidden here. And that when Jesus died, some of his blood came down through this crack and landed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. What was normally placed on the Ark of the Covenant <coughs> year after year? The blood of those goats, yes. I, I mean, and, and, and that was to remind the people <coughs> once a year by the high priest of their sins. But the Bible says that Christ died one time for all time. And that his blood was shed to totally, for all time, <coughs> forgive the sins of mankind. So what Ron believed was that his blood actually landed on the mercy seat. And that God had planned all this through time. Now, I don't know how you would react to, to this, but I thought it was very interesting and a very fascinating concept that this could have happened. After Ron began to reveal this to the Israeli government, they sealed that up and nobody has been allowed to go back into that cave again. And people sometimes will ask me, well, why would they seal that up? I mean, there's the Ark of the Covenant. Everybody's been searching for the Ark of the Covenant for years. Well, if this got out and they could prove that that was Jesus' blood on the Ark of the Covenant, what would that say? It would say he was the Son of God. 
And Israel would have to acknowledge that. They don't want that coming in. They won't, don't want anybody believing that. Now, I don't know whether you would believe this particular thing or not. Whether this, it, it may seem a bit far-fetched for you. But I think it's something that is within the realm of what our God could do and would do. And it's, it's not something that I have to have to prove anything, to prove my belief in Christ. I believe he's the Son of God far beyond that. But at least it is a very interesting possibility. Now, not far from this location is that place called Gordon's Tomb. And like I say, tomorrow we're going to be discussing that and that as a possibility of the place and, and some of the evidence that has been found there that gives indication that that was probably the real location of the burial of Jesus Christ. But today I want to continue with this idea of the crucifixion and let's look for a moment at the meaning of the cross. The cross itself was an event that happened that was an agonizing thing and you don't have to know about all that agony, I, that won't be on the test, but you will have to know the, the points that we made concerning the blood uh, the sweat drops of blood. That he was beaten. The nails. Uh, those things that we've described. You do only need to know what those are. And again, I want you to know that because tomorrow we're going to discuss it a little bit more and see how that it vividly says something that says that swoon theory is a lie. And we'll show how that says that. But when we talk about then the meaning of the cross, it indeed reveals how terrible the sin of man is. Here was a sinless man that was put to death by sinners. Here was the creator that was put to death by the fallen created. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verses 23 through 27. And I love this passage because it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then verse 24 says, And are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was a part of the sacrifice of atonement for us. And we need to be so thankful for what happened at the cross. Even though it was a terrible thing for Jesus to have to go through, it is a precious thing for us. 
But not only did his cross pay the price for our sins, but notice the next phrase in the book of Romans, chapter 25. I mean, verse 25. Romans 3. It says he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Yeah. How many sins in the Old Testament were left unpunished? Well, Abraham sinned. He was declared a righteous man. David. I mean, there's many of them that are shown there that their sins were really left unpunished. How could God be just and not do that? Because he knew that Christ was going to be crucified in the future on the cross. And the same thing that forgave, forgives our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ, looked back at all those people that had been justified by God and that blood also justified them. Verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing law? No, but on that of faith. Man's greatest need through the centuries is not wealth, health, food. For power, but the forgiveness of sins. And only Jesus Christ could do that. Sin was very ugly, but Christ would take it and he would wash it away. So, Jesus' death on the cross revealed how graphic the sin of man is and how it needed to be forgiven. And he came to do it. But it also revealed the great love God has for humanity. Jesus is dying upon the cross. He doesn't deserve to be there. He's a sinless man. And the people are down below cursing at him. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. How in the world can we love those who wrong us? Well, God said it best in the Gospel of John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God's love placed his Son on the cross for us. He took punishment that we deserved. And, of course, 
we're looking at him as the perfect sacrifice for sin. In the Old Testament, we've already talked about this, it was a lamb that was without defect, that was sacrifice. But the Hebrew writers in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 through 4, tells us that those sacrifices were an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So under the Old Testament they were doing these sacrifices year after year. Was it taking away sins? He writer says no. Paul says in his book of Galatians, no. All those sacrifices couldn't take away sins. They simply expressed the faith and obedience the children of Israel would have toward God. And expressed their faith and their trust in God. But the only thing that would, could take away sins was the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, verses 26 through 28. Yeah. Как человеком положено однажды умереть, а потом суд, как и Христос, однажды принявший себя в жертву, чтобы поднять грехи многих, во второй раз явится не для очищения греха, а для ожидания его воскресения. So this one teaches that Christ was the sacrifice that took away the sins of many people. То есть вот это говорит нам о том, что Иисус Христос это та вот жертва, которая забрала грехи многих людей. And I'm so thankful to Christ for taking away my sins. I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't have sacrificed a thousand sacrifices in the Old Testament and let that take away my sins. The only one who could take away my sin is Jesus Christ. And so, at the cross, he did that. He took away my sin. <coughs> Somebody has painted this picture and I really like it. It's to illustrate that my sins nailed Christ to that cross. And someone has suggested that if I was the only sinner in the world, Christ would have died for me. And I don't deserve his love. But he loved me anyway. And I love another picture too. That's how much Christ loved me. If I'm the only one, and I'm standing there with the nail that, I mean, the hammer that put the nails in his hand, in his hands and feet, he so loved me that he forgave me. He has such great love for me and for you that it means that we should be there ready to accept his love and follow him.
You see, through you, through Jesus Christ, this terrible thing that happened on the cross is forgiven. Now, I want to kind of draw us back to some of the very beginning stuff that we had in this course. What does Genesis 3, verse 15 say? He suggests, he said, there is going to be a conflict. And the conflict then we see all through the Old Testament. There's a conflict between God and Satan. Satan is doing everything within his power to fight against God, to fight against the bloodline, to fight against Jesus coming into the world to forgive our sins. And the amazing thing is that the battle of the ages was not World War II. The battle of the ages took place at the cross. And at that cross, Satan is trying to destroy the Son of God. But the Son of God ends up crushing Satan. As he dies there, as he is buried, and as he is raised again the third day. There's a song that I, you probably have never heard. Uh, I, I, it's not in any of our song books. It was a song that was sung uh, and written by a, a, a man and woman in the United States that are very famous for a lot of different songs. Their names are Bill and Gloria Gaither. And they wrote this song called It Is Finished. And it was a song in honor of one of the things that Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. Why did Jesus say that? Did he say that to say, well, my, you know, my suffering is just about over. It's finished. I don't believe that's the reason he was saying it. I believe that Jesus had something far more spiritual in mind than that. He knew that what was happening on the cross was this concept of this war between Satan and God is finished now. And the thing that finishes the war is Jesus' death on the cross. It is there that Jesus Christ won the battle. It is there that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. And at that point in time, the battle, the spiritual battle for mankind was really raging. But it was won right there. If you read the book of Revelation, chapter 12, you find out that it was won right there. But I want you to read you the words of this song. And I want you to just listen to it. There's a line that is drawn through the ages. 
On that line stands the old rugged cross. On that cross, a battle is raging. To gain a man's soul or its loss. On, on one side march the forces of evil. All the demons, all the devils of hell. On the other, the angels of glory. And they meet on Golgotha's hill. The earth shakes with the force of the conflict. And the sun refuses to shine. For there hangs God's sun in the balance. And then through the darkness he cries. It is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There will be no more war. It is finished. The end of the conflict. It is finished. In Jesus' is You see, the cross is the crux of Christianity. And it's at that cross that this battle was won. And we ought to love that battle. And love what was done right there. Because it was in the death and the burial and the resurrection that Jesus totally, totally won the war. Now I want to read the next verse of the song. Because today, there's a battle still going on. <coughs> and the song says, Yet in my heart, the battle was still raging. Not all the prisoners of war had come home. These were battlefields of my own making. I didn't know that the war had been won. But then I heard the king of the ages <coughs> had fought all the battles for me and that victory was mine for the taking. And now praise his name. I am. <laughs> it is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There will be no more war. It is finished. The end of the conflict. It is finished. And Jesus is Lord. I don't know about you, but that touches me. It touches me not just to know the suffering of what Jesus went through, but the power of what that suffering did. And that God loves me so much He was willing to go to that cross for me. And yes, sometimes in my heart I have battles. Sometimes in my life I have struggles. Sometimes in my life I sin. But I need to keep remembering that he won the battle for me. If you're a child of God, you are on the winning side. And that picture that we saw of that sign in Nazareth, that 
that talked about those who are not followers of Muhammad are losers. Don't you ever believe Because Jesus is the one who won the battle. And he is great Lord. Okay, I won't stop right there. Today we're going to basically <laughs> leave him in the tomb. Tomorrow we're going to talk about his resurrection. And the power of his resurrection. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God.